Great. Wow, what a fantastic crowd on this lovely, warm, hot day. Um, welcome to the new Williamstown Library. Uh, we're really excited to be partnering with Book and Paper Bookshop in Williamstown to bring David Hill to you today. Uh, he's got an extensive touring schedule all around Victoria and New South Wales, so we're really lucky to get him come today. I'll just tell you a little bit about David, and then we'll throw to the man himself. Okay, during his career, David Hill has been Chairman and Managing Director of the ABC, Chairman of the Australian Football Association, Chief Executive and Director of the State Rail Authority New South Wales, Chairman of Sydney Water Corporation and Chairman of CREATE, a national organisation responsible for representing the interests of young people and children in institutional care. He's the author of the bestsellers The Forgotten Children, 1788 and The Gold Rush. But today he's here to talk about his latest book, The Great Race. His son Damien's with us and I'd like you to give them a big Williamstown welcome. Damien's with me, and I joke. Uh, can you hear me at the back? Yes. yes. Oh, Damien's uh, with me because uh, my wife, his mum, has to spend this week uh, working in Asia, and I joke that the poor fellow's really upset he's had to miss three or four days of school. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, uh, I'll tell you where I came across this fascinating story and what attracted me to it. This, this great race between the French and the British to finish the charting of the Australian coast and produce the first full map of Australia. Now, I don't want to spoil the ending for you, but the French won. Uh, but the idea came to me about writing this book, and it's a phenomenally interesting story. Uh, when I was writing and researching the book, 1788, which was the book, of course, about the British decision to establish the convict colony in New South Wales in Botany Bay. When Arthur Phillip and one and a half thousand people were loaded onto the 11... Now, it's not back on. Is that... Is that? You just click to turn it off. It's on. Ah, it's on. I'll hold it. That's it. When Arthur Philip was uh, sent uh, with one and a half thousand people on, it's gone again. I bet he fixes it. But it seems to be working now. If not, I'll just have to speak up though. Um, let me try again. What attracted me to this story was um, when... Uh, I think we might get some help with this. Because... Yes, I'm just organising some proper work at the moment. Yeah. See, that, see that I'm next to the antenna. Make sure it's... Oh, I think he's already. No, he's yeah. to say. Oh, that's it. That's it. Well, let's try again. Speak down into it. It's on. It's on now, but we'll go on. Now. No, no, it's it keeps going off. No, it's just because you're not talking into it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid he's reached that age yeah. where I'm no longer a hero. I'm a bit of an embarrassment. <laughs> 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 Let's try. Well, shall I try and just use my voice? Well, can you hear me at the back? We've got a handheld. Do you want to go? Uh, I'll back? use the handheld. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. What a show. Uh, now, you can hear me now? Yes. Oh, good. Um, when I was researching and writing 1788, I, I was struck 
amazed that when the British committed uh, Captain Arthur Phillip and 1,500 people in the 11 little boats that formed the first fleet of convicts to settle in Botany Bay, but the English didn't know whether the east coast of Australia, New South Wales, which had been discovered by Captain Cook, and the west coast, called New Holland, discovered by the Dutch, were part of the same country, or separated by a strait or a sea from the Great Southern Ocean to the Gulf of Carpentaria. And it wasn't for another 14 years when the French sent Nicolas Baudin and the English sent Ma Matthew Flinders to chart the remaining unknown coast to confirm that it was in fact largely one land, ma major landmass. Um, uh, the other thing that I found interesting when researching this European discovery of Australia is most people think that the discovery, the European discovery of Australia was overwhelmingly a British event. Uh, I'm still amazed at the number of Australians if you say, who discovered Australia? And they say, Captain Cook. When in fact Cook was a relative latecomer and a fairly minor player in the grand scheme of things. Uh, this process of the discovery and the mapping of Australia goes back 200 years before uh, Flinders and Baudin when the Dutch, who had taken over the Spice Islands, you know, a large part of the history of, of uh, the Pacific and Australia was driven by first the Portuguese and then the Dutch who were exploiting the spices in current day Indonesia. And the Dutch, who had taken over from the Portuguese, sent all these expeditions to try and find gold and silver. They'd found it in America, and they were bound to find it here, and they sent all these expeditions to Australia in the early 1600s, starting with Willem Jansoon, who was the first confirmed mapper of Australian soil in the Gulf of Carpentaria way back in 1606. And over the next 50 years, the Dutch travelled along and charted about 50% of the Australian coast. Um, along the west coast you've all heard of Hartog and, and Vlaming and the sinking of the, Bata the wrecking of the Batavia. But the most remarkable of all was Abel Tasman, who in 1642 went on an amazing voyage. They weren't interested, the Dutch, in scientific discovery. They were only interested in trade and wealth. And uh, Tasman's voyage, nowadays regarded as one of the greatest pieces of navigation in history at the time, was regarded as a failure because he came back empty-handed to Batavia. But he sailed from Batavia west to the island of Mauritius. And then he sailed south and he picked up these strong westerly winds that took him across and he found Van Diemen's Land. And of course he stuck the plaque in the ground. They all did this incidentally. They all claimed it for their country when they found it. And then he went on to and found New Zealand. Two years later, he was sent to chart the top of Australia. And Abel Tasman in 1644, I mean, this is still well over 100 years before Cook, charted about 5,000 kilometres of the north and the northwest coast of, of Australia. So by the end of the 1600s, we already knew, or Europe already knew, about half of the Australian coast. Cork didn't come until, until uh, 1770, and coming to Australia was a secondary part of his voyage. He had been sent to Tahiti to, to observe the transit of Venus, and uh, we had one this year, a, a transit of Venus. They only occur <coughs> twice in pairs about 120 years apart. And uh, uh, the reason why they sent Cook to the farther, furthest place in the world is that if by measuring the transit of Venus over the face of the Sun, uh, you can measure the distance between the planets in the solar system by having different angles to measure at different times. And, and after that, Cook was sent over to try and find this mysterious Great South Land and of course found the East Coast and charted the whole of the East Coast of Australia. But Cook wasn't the first Englishman to come here as an explorer. Seventy years before Cook, the first Englishman to come to Australia and chart the coast was the pirate William Dampier, who landed on the west, he'd been 
12 years pirating around the world. And uh, first of all in the Spanish Caribbean, and then down and around the uh, South American coast, across the Pacific. Uh, and he ended up in the early 1690s uh, on the west coast of Western Australia. And he found it pretty inhospitable, as did, as did the, uh, the Dutch before him. And he went back to England, and he became the only Englishman, or the, only, the first person to come to Australia a second time. Because despite the fact that he had been an out-and-out -out pirate, raping and pillaging around the world, the British by now were really interested in the colonial potential of the Great South Land, and they sent, even though Dampier had never commanded a ship before, they sent him back as captain of the Roebuck to explore the potential of the West Australian coast for the British. And uh, Dampier is largely left out of our histories, I think because he was such a bad boy. But the truth is Dampier was an accomplished oceanographer, an accomplished uh, charter. Um, his, his, his books are well worth reading even today of the two voyages he did to Australia. Uh, he, he was an anthropologist, a sociologist, a natural historian. Charles Darwin commended, he came of course more, nearly 200 years later, but he commended uh, the writings of, uh, of William Dampier and the observations of William Dampier. Dampier was a huge influence on, on literature and science. Um, uh, he was an inspiration for Robinson Crusoe, he was an inspiration for the rhyme of the ancient mariner, and he was an inspiration for Gulliver's uh, uh, travels. Uh, but of course he had been a pirate. But, well, for example, William Dampier told Europe for the first time a lot about Asia and the Pacific they didn't know. Uh, for example, he gave the first account of the Chinese practice of foot-binding little girls to, to retard the growth of their feet. And the Europeans were almost in disbelief of, of this practice until Dampier gave such a detailed account of it. The other group that have sort of slipped out of the history of the discovery of Australia and are the French. Uh, what I find remarkable about the French commitment to scientific discovery in Australia is from the storming of the Bastille, the execution of uh, Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, uh, the terror, the French Revolution, the rise of Napoleon, and for decades that France was at war with practically all of her European neighbours, the French maintained this unbelievable, consistent commitment to sending ships of exploration to Australia. Bougainville saw the northeast coast of Australia before Cook, two years before Cook, but couldn't get through the Great Barrier Reef. St. Alawan, the west coast of Australia. Uh, uh, Marion de Fresne, who was uh, murdered by Maori New Zealanders who'd been to Van Diemen's Land. The wonderful La Perouse, who had been on this huge voyage to Siberia in the North Pacific and arrived, and what were the odds? La Perouse arrives in Botany Bay three days after Philip and the First Fleet. Can you imagine the shock they both got? <laughs> that there'd been nobody on the east coast of Australia in history except Cook, 18 years before. And it was a result of Cook's voyage. And incidentally, none of these explorers, up to and including Cook, could recommend settlement of Australia. Because when they landed on the coast, they had difficulty finding water, they had difficulty finding fertile soil. And it was only the desperation of the British to do something with the convicts but they accepted the recommendation of Sir Joseph Banks who had been the botanist on the endeavour with Cook but they said and incidentally when uh, Arthur Phillip arrived in Botany Bay they found it to be an absolute dud and the First Fleet and Arthur Phillip abandoned Botany Bay in three days and he sailed up and he, he went inside Port Jackson Heads that Cook had seen from two to three miles out to sea. Nobody knew what was in Port Jackson. Uh, Cook, when he left Botany Bay, and he'd only spent a week there uh, uh, with, uh, they called it Botany Bay because of the botanist uh, Joseph Banks. Uh, and as he left in 1770, he just made a one, one sentence entry in his log, 
the, the, between, I'll name this point, Jack, uh, Port Jackson, these two heads, Sydney heads, and uh, Philip went to have a look, and he found water in what he called Sydney Cove. So he's trying to get the ships out of Botany Bay to move to Sydney. The English went on calling Botany Bay the destination for convicts for the next 70 years, and yet not one convict ever landed or settled in Botany Bay. But what were the odds, as Philip, there were these huge winds of blowing the first fleet back into Botany Bay as they're trying to get out and get up to Sydney, and as they're battling to get out, the French are battling to get in. It was La Perouse, already three years into his voyage. And of course the disappearance of La Perouse, who was such an enormously popular figure, united a very divided France. Indeed, uh, Louis XVI, on the eve of his execution, is said to have asked, is there any news of Monsieur La Perouse? And of course there wasn't. And uh, uh, the French sent out uh, to find, or to try and find La Perouse, uh, Bruni d'Entrecasto, another giant figure in Australian exploration who's hardly heard of by most Australians. And of course you have the d'Entrecasto channel uh, near Hobart in the mouth of the Derwent and the, and the Bruni Island, uh, as in Bruni uh, d'Entrecasto. In fact, d'Entrecasto, contrary to what most school kids in Australia think, that Matthew Flinders was the first to circumnavigate Australia, in looking for La Perouse, Don Tricasto did it a decade earlier, from Van Diemen's Land to Van Diemen's Land. So, the French, the Dutch, uh, the British have pieced together most of Australia, but it's now 1800, and we still don't know, even though the first fleet has been there for more than a dozen years in Sydney, we don't know if Australia is one landmass or two. And at exactly the same time, the French and the British sent rival expeditions to find out. The French expedition, which left nine months earlier, which should have given them a winnable lead in the race to chart the unknown coast, was led by Baudin, Nicolas Baudin. The expedition was personally authorised by Napoleon Bonaparte himself, because he was now first consul and soon to crown himself emperor. I hope you had a chance to see that fantastic exhibition in the Victorian Gallery, because there's a lot of the Bodan exhibition was in, it's closed now I think, uh, but there was a lot about uh, Bodan's expedition in that exhibition. Uh, Bodan was older than uh, his rival Flinders, he was 46, 47, and um, uh, the French gave him two ships, the Geograph and the Naturalist, and there are lots of places around the Australian coast called geograph or naturalist even today and uh, um, he also had a passport now England and France were just continually at war but their scientific elites were close to each other and uh, the British gave Bodan a passport which had strict conditions that provided he was only engaged in scientific study he could get passage Matthew Flinders, his rival, was only 26. Much younger, much more junior rank, only took one ship, the Investigator, only took six scientists, the French took 22. The amazing thing about these French expeditions is that they took so, so much uh, equipment and so many scientists on the expedition. Flinders might have been more junior and less experienced, but he had already, unlike Baudin, been to Australia twice before. He had, as a teenager, as a midshipman, he had travelled with William Bly, not on the bounty. It was after the mutiny, and as you know, Bly got back and was sent again to collect the breadfruits from the Pacific, and Flinders was on uh, the second Bly voyage. Flinders went back to Australia uh, in the 1790s, and this is after the settlement of Sydney, and with his good friend George Bass, did the explorations south of Sydney for the first time along the coast in that tiny little boat called the Tom Thumb. And it was only three metres long. And a lot of that exploration, three metres, I mean, it's from Hitnathal along, with, and there was uh, only room for, for Flinders, for George Bass, and George Bass's little servant boy, Martin, which I all th always thought was very suspicious. Anyway, there was this tiny little uh, boat, the Tom Thumb, and then 
Uh, the two of them, Bass and Flinders, in a slightly larger ship, the, the, the Norfolk, of course, discovered the Bass Strait. Now, up until then, it was thought that Van Diemen's Land, or Tasmania, and the mainland were joined, and this was a, a huge discovery. So Flinders was very experienced. Uh, it was on that uh, discovery of the Bass Strait, on that trip to Australia, he was here five years, uh, that he adopted Trim the Cat, who became uh, a, a great uh, friend and pet and companion to Flinders through all of his uh, later adventures. Flinders re almost didn't leave England on the investigator for the big exploration because he was nearly sacked. And the reason for that was he'd been away five years and he gets back to England, he gets the job on the investigator and he's going to leave England nine months after Bodan and he proposes to Anne Chapel, and she agrees to marry him. She's waited five years for him to come back. Um, and, uh, of course, it's against all the Navy regulations uh, to take a woman on an exploration like this. And Flinders smuggled her aboard and uh, nearly got away with it, but shortly before... And this is so well documented. Uh, shortly before leaving England, inspectors on behalf of the Lords of the Admiralty were shocked to find Mrs. Flinders, the new bride, in the captain's cabin without her bonnet. <laughs> and uh, it was only the intervention of the by now hugely influential S Sir Joseph Banks uh, that saved Flinders. But, but uh, uh, Banks gave uh, Flinders a terrible uh, stripping down um, uh, about, about the incident. And I have to say this, given, given the choice of his love, his new bride, and uh, the exploration of Australia, Flinders didn't hesitate. He dropped Anne at Portsmouth and off, off his <laughs> Now, Flinders has got a nine months leave. He's got very detailed instructions. They know the bit of Australia. It's here. This is a, a map from the late 1700s, and this is what they knew about Australia. This is Cook. And this is the Dutch and the French and everybody else. And they did not know if this went through to the Gulf of Carpentaria. And Flinders and, and uh, Bodin both had very elaborate instructions. And Bodin was supposed to come straight here and chart this unknown coast. The ex expedition went pear-shaped from the beginning. Uh, by the time he got to Mauritius, he was a month late, and uh, uh, there were some very attractive women on Mauritius, which is now a French island, and half the scientists refused to go any further. <laughs> but his officers went ashore, and complaining they were sick. And uh, Flinders complained that he went to the hospital and he spoke to the Sisters of Charity who ran it in Port Louis in, in Mauritius, and uh, they said that sometimes the officers came back to sleep in the evening at the hospital, but he couldn't find a single soul in the hospital where his officers were. So he left Mauritius, minus a few of his crew, uh, and headed for, for Cape Lewin, where he was instructed to chart the, the unknown coast. And uh, incidentally, a lot of this was already known because a Dutchman, Peter Neuitz, remarkably got as far as current-day Sejuna in the 1620s, and named two islands, St. Peter and St. Francis, which were the islands of Lilliput uh, in the Gulliver's, Swift's Gulliver's Travels. When Bonan got here, he was running so late, he feared the onset of the so Southern Hemisphere winter, and strangely, in contravention of his instructions, went to Timor. And he decided to chart, leave to the next summer, uh, started to chart those bits of the Western Australian coast uh, that the Dutch had missed, including Geograph Bay in here, uh, that near, near current day Bunbury. And so he left Timor not knowing that his rival Flinders was just leaving England, sailed back down the Western Australian coast with a lot of his crew had contacted dysentery. Incidentally, these trips were very hazardous. Of all those French explorers, Apart from Bougainville, all of them died before getting home. Imagine you're on any of these expeditions. You're on a leaking little ship 
the largest of which wouldn't have been 30 metres long, which is from here to the end of the corridor. You would be gone for two to three years, absolute minimum. You, in pre-refrigeration, you had no fresh food after a couple of weeks out of the port and you lived on a basic diet of salted, rotten meat and the hard, what was called hardtack biscuit, the sailor's biscuit. This was bread that had been deliberately baked to be almost completely devoid of moisture because a loaf of bread will go off in a week in the tropics and the hardtack would last for a very long time. But the problem was, even if you still had any teeth left, it, when you, it would break your teeth trying to break it. And it was invariably infested with weevils. But, but enlightened, enlightened commanders, of course, recognised this was a valuable source of protein. That they, that. And, and, of course, you had no personal effects other than what you could stuff into a canvas bag. You didn't even have a bed. You had a hammock. You had no bathroom, no toilet, and uh, you lived uh, for two to three years largely barefoot. There were no point in shoes uh, on those ships. The only saving uh, grace, I thought, was that for 300 years the standard Royal Navy ration was half a pint of rum per day per man, uh, which meant a lot of these guys spent most of the time in a bit of a st an alcoholic uh, stupor. But in all of these expeditions, a loss of 50%. 50% of you are going to die before you get back, and that was regarded as uh, a pretty acceptable rate. And it wasn't sudden death like accidents at sea that the big killers were scurvy, which they eventually discovered was largely diet related. And if you stopped in the East Indies, uh, Cook described Batavia as the unhealthiest place on earth, <coughs> dysentery. And dysentery killed a lot of Bodan's crew and it killed a lot of Flinders' crew. Anyway, uh, Bodan comes back down from Timor, not realising now that Flinders has already left uh, England. He sails across here to Van Diemen's Land and he stops in Van Diemen's Land for the winter where his botanists and scientists have a field day and then they go up the east coast of uh, Tasmania and then through the Bass Strait from the east and Bodan starts searching the unknown coast in 1802, a year late, but he doesn't know that Flinders has made haste and has got here and Flinders is coming from the west. So they're coming in and they met. What odds were that? No ships had ever sailed here before. And in, in April 1802, the two of them met. But not before Flinders won the race to chart the unknown coast. He went into the two big gulfs in South Australia and he charted them and he discovered, he fought, fought at first because of the currents. It was a sea that came all the way through Australia, but of course it wasn't. It was the two gulfs. The first he named Spencer Gulf after Princess Di's great great grandfather, who was a Lord of the Admiralty, and the other, where Adelaide is today, the Gulf of St. Vincent. On the way, they uh, lost, uh, Flinders only had 78 crew and he lost 8 of them in a boating accident uh, before Lincoln in South Australia which wasn't, it was named after his uh, home uh, county of Lincolnshire um, so he meets Bodan at what became Encounter Bay, an, an amazing what are the odds of this happening? Uh, both of them uh, 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 recorded the, the encounter Flinders said that they got a call from the crow's nest saying that they could see a pyramid white rock sticking out of the sea and of course they put their glasses on and it's flying, flying French colours. Incidentally, remember there were two French ships but twice they lost each other. Uh, Baudin today would be called eccentric. He was absolutely detested by his crew and the scientists which was a, a large factor I think in why uh, he's been judged so poorly by, by history. <coughs> but Flinders said but uh, at first he didn't know if they were still at war. Uh, French colours, he was at war, they were at war when he left England. And uh, so he said that he, he took the ship broadside. In fact, this is a painting of Flinders rowing across Bodan, gestured uh, goodwill. And so Flinders, being the younger and the lesser rank, rows across from the investigator to the geograph and uh, but Dan, strangely, didn't speak any English. Flinders took with him 
Robert Brown, the botanist, who speak, spoke fluent French. And, and Brown had a record of the meeting as well. Uh, but Bo Dan, who spoke no English, didn't invite any of his colleagues to the meeting that evening or for breakfast uh, next morning. And uh, he also, remarkably, didn't ask Flinders exactly who he was. Because uh, Flinders only twigged in the second meeting that Bodan hadn't, didn't have a clue who he was. And uh, how, how he came across it was that uh, Bodan in the second meeting said that he'd come up the east coast of Tasmania and he complained about how bodgy the maps that he... They all had each other's maps. And it was Flinders' maps from his circumnavigation of Tasmania. And he's saying how crook the maps are, not realising that he's talking to the bloke that made them. Anyway, they leave each other after the encounter. Bodan goes to chart what is no longer the unknown coast and Flinders comes this way. Flinders came into Port Phillip Bay but he didn't know until he got to Sydney and nor did Bodan because he had been serving, surveying this area but of course John Murray ten weeks before Flinders got here was the first into, into Port Phillip Bay and he, uh, um, Point Patterson was where he put down the flag and uh, drank a toast to King George uh, the Third. So Bodan and Flinders winter sets in and they both end up in Sydney. And it's a fantastic encounter in Sydney. The governor at the time is Philip King, who had come out with the first fleet. He was on his third trip to Australia. Of course, he was the, a great friend and supporter of Flinders. He, he became a very important supporter of Flinders. But he also became a very close friend of uh, Nicholas Bodan because King spoke fluent French. It was King who was sent on behalf of Arthur Phillip to meet uh, La Perouse and, and provides us with one of the last great accounts of La Perouse before he disappeared in 1788. And uh, 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 Matthew Flinders tells a terrific story. Uh, one night there, host, uh, Philip King's hosted a dinner at the very modest government house in Sydney and uh, for the French officers and the English officers and by now, Bodan's uh, colleagues are so upset with him that he squandered a nine months lead and the English had charted the unknown coast first that uh, uh, Henri Freshenay, one of the French officers, cycles up to Flinders and said, uh, Captain Flinders, had we not been kept collecting shells and chasing butterflies in Van Diemen's land, you wouldn't have done it before us, which was largely true. <laughs> anyway, by now, both of them, the French and the British, oh, they've both now seen these gulfs. They've both got the old explorer's maps and their new explorer's maps. And so they have to do a bit more charting before they're going to race back to Europe and complete the first map. Flinders leaves Sydney and goes north on his famous circumnavigation of Australia. Baudin goes south and wants to continue the south coast that he hasn't seen because of the winter and he goes up the west coast and he gets almost to the Tiwi Islands, Bathurst and Melville Islands and he does a lot of very good charting with the naturalist and the geograph. He's now got enough. He was going to go into the Gulf of Kim Carpentaria but he said no we'll just use the old Dutch maps and with an armload of maps he's heading back to Europe he's going to beat Flinders. He may not have beaten them to the unknown coast, but he can, he can race him, beat him in the race back to do the maps. And he gets as far as Mauritius, and Bodan dies. All of these guys died early. He died of tuberculosis, particularly ugly death. Incidentally, he was so unpopular that the task of writing up the Bodan expedition account was left to uh, a guy called Francois Perron, who was a botanist on the Geograph, and Perron managed to write almost the entire account of the Bodan exhibition without mentioning Bodan once. <laughs> the only reference in the Bodan account was when Bodan died. He said, Commander Bodan ceased to exist. <laughs> Meanwhile, Flinders has abandoned his uh, charting up in Arnhem Land because the investigators rotting. It's falling to bits and leaking. He's 6,000 miles 
from, from help in Sydney. So he decides to go and do some repairs in Timor and then sail back to Sydney. He gets to Timor and half his crew contact dysentery. And so they load up with what food, fresh food they can and water. These were hazardous trips. And he starts several months' voyage back to Sydney. And some of his crew were dying when he left uh, uh, Timor. And they were dying as they saw Sydney heads. And he got back in terrible shape. Uh, but now he's got enough maps. He's aware the French are ahead of him. And Baudin may have died, he didn't know that, but the French, that the survivors on the two French ships could go back and complete the maps. So Flinders gets on a ship because the investigator's crook and Philip King helps him. He gets on a ship called the Porpoise and he heads for home with another little ship called the Cato. And blow me, he's shipwrecked on the, on the Great Barrier Reef. It was at this point I thought, if I was writing a novel, you wouldn't believe it by now. <laughs> so they get, most of them survive the shipwreck, and he puts all the survivors on a sandbar. It's called Wreck Reef today, 2,000 kilometres north of Sydney, off the North Queensland coast. And then Flinders gets into a little boat with a, a single mast. It was the, it was the, the runner for the, for the uh, porters. And with 12 guys alternating with the rowing, rows and sails to Sydney for help. And uh, uh, Philip King rallies what, the, there was a chronic shortage of shipping in the colony in those early days. But anyway, they send these uh, ships back and they get back to Rep Reef and blow me, all 97 survivors on the sandbar were still alive. Uh, they managed to get some sails from the wreck of the porpoise to make tents. They got some water ashore, but there was a lot of rain up there anyway, and they did a lot of fishing, and they had a bit of food. So all of them were rescued. Uh, some of them, including uh, uh, Flinders' brother Samuel, were taken on to China, and they progressively picked up English ships back home. And uh, some others were brought back to Sydney. But Flinders is desperate to get to England with his maps. So he gets on a 20-foot lot, about the length of this room, with 12 crew, a little ship called the Cumberland, and heads for home, well aware that the French are ahead of him, and he stopped at Mauritius. Mm, <laughs> oh, among his 12 crew, of course, he also had Trim the Cat. Now, Philip King had told him not to stop at the French island of Mauritius. They were at war. Uh, Flinders' passport, remember he had a passport? But there were strict conditions attached. It was for the investigator, not the Cumberland. He had no instructions to land in, in Mauritius. And worse than that, when they, when the uh, Decan, the governor, he was very spiteful. They, they jailed Flinders for six and a half years on Mauritius. And they progressively let the 12 of his crew go. And in the end, it was just Flinders and Trim. And to add to his woes, uh, he, he found a home for Trim, a little French girl on Mauritius, uh, but Flinders, uh, Trim disappeared and Flinders wrote that he believed Trim unfortunately became uh, the, the contents of a pot of stew on the island of Mauritius. Um, they found documents uh, on the Cumberland of, that uh, Flinders was carrying military documents for Philip King for the War Secretary in London. So there's no doubt the French had enough evidence that Flinders had done the wrong thing, and they, they held, detained him as a spy. Anyway, Flinders is there from 1804, well, the end of 1803, until 1810. And, of course, with the death of uh, uh, Baudin, it slowed up the French map-making. And then Piron, who's got the task of completing, he's almost completed the account of the Baudin exhibition, and Perron dies in 1810. So Flinders ends up back in London. The French let him go eventually because the British were just about to invade Mauritius, which they, they did later that year. So Flinders, and the journey back is another terrific adventure, but I'll leave you to read that. So Flinders gets back to London and starts earnestly preparing his map. This is 1810, and it took him till 1814, and in 1811 he was beaten to it. Uh, Louis Freshenay, one of the uh, chartists on the on the geograph published the first complete map of Australia. So the Freshenay map 
of uh, 1811 became the first completed map of uh, the island continent of Australia. Flinders continued to work on his account and his map and he finished it in 1814 and he died the day after its publication. Yeah. A sad story. But as I often say, sad though uh, these events were, think of the people they left behind, think of poor Anne Chapel, who waited five years for Flinders to come back from his earlier trip to Australia. And then he engaged, uh, proposed to her, married her, promised to take her to Australia, dumped her in Portsmouth. She waited another 10 years before he came back. And then he's a very sick man. Mind you, they, they, they uh, managed to have a daughter who later gave birth uh, to the Flinders Petrie, uh, the famous Egypt archaeologist. So the, the uh, family tradition uh, continued. Uh, I found this uh, an absolutely fascinating story. I hope that you might get some of the pleasure that I got out of researching and writing it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, David. That's great. We've got time for a few questions. Yeah, sure, sure. yeah? Just have a drink of water. That's still working. That's good. Uh, any questions? The freshie that you talked about, is that the name, <clears throat> the name after him down in Tasmania? Yes. yes. Um, uh, is the, the Freshenay name the name of the Freshenay in Tasmania? The answer is yes, but there were two Freshenays. Okay. Uh, um, uh, they were, they were uh, uh, twins, 21 years old when they, they left. They were both uh, lieutenants. They came from very wealthy families, and despite the fact that Bodan was part of the revolution, the officers in the Navy still tended to come from, from better families. Um, it, uh, the more prominent of the two was Louis Freshenay, who, who completed the first map. Um, and uh, he, he came out, I think 1818, came out later on his own expedition uh, of uh, the North Coast. It's a very interesting issue about the names on the maps. The British were really upset, but they said, because Flinders' map came second, of course, and when the French, the Freshenay map was uh, first published, of course, they'd given all the places French names. And the Spencer Golf and the Golf of St. Vincent, the French name Golf Napoleon and Golf jo Josephine. Uh, and, uh, but look, in fairness, uh, Flinders hadn't published his map. They did know that he'd been there first, but they didn't know what names he had given them all. And it wasn't until Flinders got back to London that he, he started giving them their English names. Well, what... what uh, happened, which was very helpful, is that after the publication of the Flinders map, progressively modern maps dropped those French names and put in where Flinders had been there first and named them, uh, they, they took over the English names like the Gulf, uh, Spencer Gulf. Uh, so now uh, all of the stuff Flinders found first has got Flinders names uh, and the stuff that the French found first is uh, kept like fresh and uh, These places that the French found first and named first have kept them. Uh, for those of you that uh, drink wine, for example, uh, drink Vasse Felix yeah. red wine. Uh, Vasse, which is just here, uh, Vasse was a, a seaman on the Geograph, and it was the first fatality of the Bodan. He was washed overboard in a small boat that had gone ashore trying to get drinking water. And, uh, and they named the point Vasse, which is now the vineyard. And similarly, here is Geograph Bay, named after. So, and, and uh, Esperance um, in Western Australia is named after the ship of Don Tracasto, who had earlier come out to try and find La Perouse. So where, where the, the, uh, the French had been first and named it, they've now got their names, and where Flinders did, they, they've got their names. So, so, so. David, in their uh, trip, uh, trip and, uh, and mapping, did they spend much time on the land itself, exploring um, the mm, land and no, making no. recommendations about potential settling of those areas? Well, the, the, the instructions were unbelievably elaborate um, uh, uh, for, for, for their expeditions, um, and they were to uh, uh, give accounts of inland rivers, uh, the fertility of the soil, the plant life, the animal life, and so on. 
Um, uh, interestingly, there's no evidence that the French had any aspiration to colonise or to settle, uh, but of course by the time of Flinders, uh, uh, they had already settled. Uh, everybody claimed it when they discovered something for their king and their country. Uh, uh, but it was settlement, the convict settlement, uh, was, was establishing your, your claim to the, the, the territory. Uh, yes, they, came, they largely came ashore for water and firewood. And if they could, uh, animal meat. Uh, for example, after uh, uh, Spencer Gulf and the Gulf of St. Vincent, Flinders went across and discovered Kangaroo Island and he named it Kangaroo Island for obvious reasons. But of course the kangaroos at that point had no known predators. And so the English who hadn't seen any fresh meat for seven months went and clubbed about 150 kangaroos to death and cooked up these huge pots of kangaroo stew. And of course when they went back to the mainland and, uh, uh, to continue charting, they came back to Kangaroo Island the second time and there were no kangaroos to be seen because the kangaroos had worked out they do have a predator. But they learned uh, very quickly. Um, yes, they, uh, uh, most of these uh, expeditions, particularly the French, required them to make studies of the local inhabitants. And uh, uh, the French record in their dealing with the indigenous Australians, the Aboriginal Australians, uh, tended to be a bit more sophisticated uh, and uh, a bit more fruitful than, than the, uh, in, in my reading of it, than, than the English experience. Uh, there, was, there was very little bloodshed. Uh, both had instructions to get on with the locals and not to antagonise them. And there were a number of incidents that resulted in both blacks and whites being killed over this 200 year period. Uh, but n nothing as aggressive as, as uh, Marion de Fresme encountered with the uh, uh, New Zealand Maoris. So, the on land, no, they weren't doing inland exploration. It was just, you know, close to the coast. Itself. Yes, yes, yes. David, did you find the evidence to support the Mahogany ship? This is a terrific, terrific question. I, I, I've taught, I, it's, in, it's in the book. Um, the first undisputed a charting of the Australian coast uh, was the surviving Willem Jansoon, the Dutch, of 300 kilometres here. He, uh, oh, incidentally, he didn't know it was Australia. He thought it was a continuation of the New Guinea coast because a few months after Jansoon, Torres, of course, had been through the Torres Straits. But remarkably, the Spanish kept it a secret from everybody for 150 years. So if you've seen the famous Tasman maps, of the 1700, it looks like the Gulf of Carpentaria goes like a long arch, but it's because they didn't know about the Torres Straits. The question is, did the Portuguese get here first? And there's this famous issue of a, a piece of an old wooden ship at Warrnambool. Um, I'm attracted to that. Uh, there is no conclusive proof of the Portuguese being here before Jansoon in 1606, but there are there's some pretty compelling and attractive evidence that they did. There's first of all the Warrnambool wreck, which was seen by Governor Hotham uh, in about 1649, 1650. Uh, it was last seen down at Warrnambool in the 18th, late 19th century. I, I think it was eight, the 1870s, the 1880s. It's, I've put it in the book. And of course the Victorian state, if any of you want to get rich quick, the Victorian state government posted a reward of a quarter of a million dollars in the 1970s for anybody that could find it. And I don't know if the reward still stands because nobody's collected it anyway. But I, look, I tell you what, it, to me is a more attractive piece of evidence that the, were the Portuguese here in the hundred years before the Dutch, in the early 1500s, whereas the Dutch were here for the first time in the early 1600s. And there are no surviving Portuguese records suggesting they were, and there are no surviving Portuguese maps suggesting they were here. But what does survive from the later 1500s, uh, and there are some photographs of them in the book, the famous French Dieppe maps, Java Le Grand, and these were beautifully made enameled maps for royalty and for rich patrons. These maps were made. 
and they were said to have been made in the, the city of Dieppe, the so-called Dieppe maps uh, in France, based on earlier surviving Portuguese copies, of which none still exist. And a lot of people who argue the Portuguese were here say, look, those bits of the coast are too similar to the reality, right? And it, it's got to have been based on earlier Portuguese maps. The most persuasive evidence of all for me comes from Matthew Flinders himself. Flinders said of the DF maps, they're too close to the reality to be dismissed as conjecture alone. Mm. And, and I'm, 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 I find that pretty, pretty attractive. So the jury's still out, uh, but geez, that's pretty powerful stuff because uh, Flinders, if anything, would have taken more credit if the Portuguese hadn't been there before him. And for him to say that, um, what do you think? Oh, the Chinese. Uh, that, is, that is another one, and I deal with that in the book as well. Were the Chinese here first? Well, again, I, I, I'm, I'm attracted. There were no, no hard evidence. Um, uh, but, again, I'm, I'm attracted uh, by something Flinders found. When he was charting the Gulf of Carpentaria, uh, he found uh, on land uh, uh, a stone wall structure uh, with uh, stone wall partitions going perpendicular uh, that he thought were built by the Chinese for the processing of the wild nutmeg up in that part of the country. And, uh, geez, when people are building stone walls, you know, that suggests that they're staying for a while. Um, and I, I can't think it... I think Fenders was right. I think the Chinese had built them. And Fenders also bumped into some Malay fishermen. And it's a terrific story. Um, uh, uh, off Arnhem Land, and uh, they explained to him for hundreds of years they had been coming and catching the tree pang or the, the sea cucumber, uh, <coughs> drying it, and it was a delicacy in China. Now, these fishermen were actually Malays or Malaccans, but, but uh, there's no doubt there was trade for hundreds of years between the Chinese and North Australia. So, again, no absolutely conclusive proof, but uh, I'm, I'm attracted by by the evidence that the Chinese uh, came regularly to the north of Australia and stayed there for periods of time. But that might be the next book. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sure you'll agree with me. Fascinating story. Very well told. Thank you so much, David. Thank you for coming to the I don't know if you know that Williamstown itself has got a proud maritime history. If you know much about Melbourne. Oh, yes, yes, yes I do. Um, <laughs> in fact, uh, um, Flinders was only beaten by 10 weeks to get into Port Phillip Bay okay. first. Yep. And uh, uh, both he and Bodan, uh, after their encounter, uh, Bodan had uh, not come into the bay, mm -hmm. but he'd come around the north of Tasmania, of course. But Flinders came in, thought he was the first here. Uh, but of course he'd been beaten by 10 weeks uh, by uh, John Murray uh, who was a junior naval officer in Sydney in early 1802 who was sent on a little ship called the Norfolk uh, which of course Flinders in five years before had used to circumnavigate uh, so it was his own ship that was used and he was beaten to coming into Port Phillip Bay by, by John Murray by 10 weeks Wow. You, it sounds like you could tell stories all day. <laughs> but, but I know you've got to get to Queenscliff tonight. So thanks once again. That's fantastic. Um, David's one of the um, authors we've had here at Williamstown Library for our opening. We've only been open for six weeks and we've got some more coming next month. Alice Pong and Peter Bukowski. Uh, we've got some brochures around the corner which are going to bring that table with food and brochures around to here in a minute. So what we're going to do now is clear some of the chairs up the back so David can get up the back. And Book and Paper will be selling his books. David's more than happy to sign them. Um, they've got wrapping paper if you want to buy one to give to someone for Christmas. And uh, thank you all for coming. There'll be tea and coffee around here as well. So thanks once again, David, and everyone else for coming too. Thank you.